Hi, I'm still on Chikiyu, and if you look behind me and on top, you can see essentially the um, heli deck, the helipad, where I used to give my lecture last time. And right below, if you take a, a close look, you can see the derrick. So we're at the aft of the ship, that means the front of the ship, and we are offshore Japan on the Nankai Trough, and it's IODP Expedition 365. The goal of the expedition is to deploy long-term repository in this fault zone to basically monitor the seismology of the, of the fault zone. But the goal of our lecture is slightly different. We're interested in knowing what happened to sediments and how they transform into rocks. So this lecture is all about diagenesis. <music> So this lecture is what I like to call stratigraphy post-mortem. In other words, what happens to sediment and to strata after they are buried. And indeed, not just after they're buried, but really from seafloor all the way down to the metamorphic realm. So we are going to talk about diagenesis. And the definition of diagenesis is all the physical chemical processes that happen to sediments from the instant they are created all the way to, well, what's the limit of diagenesis? roughly 250 degrees. So diagenesis is really the beginning of the history of, of burial. And the limit, again, in terms of temperature, traditionally is from 0 to 250 degrees. And in terms of pressure, that's a vertical axis here, it's um, less than 4.5 kilobars. After diagenesis, of course, we enter the realm of metamorphism. And metamorphism goes all the way to a thousand degree and it's um, divided into different grades, but that's really not the goal of uh, our class today. Now, the distinction between diagenesis and metamorphism can be expressed this way. Diagenesis results in sedimentary rocks, metamorphism results in metamorphic rocks. So in a way, we really are going to look at how sediments become rock in sedimentary systems today. So today, we really are going to look at how sediments like sand, loose sand, becomes a sandstone, or how a carbonate reef or carbonate sediments becomes a limestone. And that's what diagenesis is all about. So let's talk about litification. What are the processes of litification? How do we go from a loose sediment to a rock? There's really two ways you can litify a rock. Let's start by talking about compaction. So imagine that you have a sediment that is water laden, so a fine grain mud that contains 50 to 60% water. If you compact that sediment, you can reduce the amount of water, 10 to 20% water, but at the same time also compaction leads to induration and so litification. So the, the very process of compaction can lead to litification. And this is very visible in classic rocks. So if you look at mudstone, for instance, and here on the horizontal axis, we have porosity. On the vertical axis, we have depth, which can equate to pressure, lithostatic uh, pressure. You can see that porosity in those mudstone decreases with increasing depth, which is a function really of dewatering, of losing water. Now, if you look at coarser sediments, for instance, sandstone, you can see that we also have the same uh, general decay of porosity with depth, but it's a much straighter curve. We don't have that very rapid decrease in porosity at the surface, followed by a more gentle decrease in, in porosity. And that's because sandstone and mudstone have different uh, properties. And so they dewater at different rates and they, they don't have the same potential for compaction. So how do you actually litify a sandstone? Well, normally in sandstone, you have a mix of large grains, mostly quartz, and platy minerals like clays, for instance. And as you compact these uh, sediments, what happens is the large grains won't deform, but the platy minerals will deform, and so they will form a framework. 
And that process of deforming the plastic minerals leads to lithification because you create a framework that is intricately linked and cannot be um, easily broken. That's why a pure arcosic sand without any clays will still be loose if it's only compaction. You will not form a rock of this uh, sediments. But if you have a more typical sandstone that has a few percentages of um, impurities in it, clays, etc., then you have the potential just through compaction to form a solid rock. And this is a diagenetic process linked to the burial environment. And that burial environment is really characterized by two things. It's, it's characterized by an increase in pressure, which you can see here on the horizontal axis, the vertical axis represents depth. And you can see that the deeper you go, the higher the pressure. Now, the exact pressure that you will have depends on how much fluid you, you have, what your hydrostatic pressure is, and what your lithostatic pressure is. So the, the pressure of the grains of rock um, against each other. And the second thing that also changed with burial is temperature. The subsurface is characterized by an increase in temperature. And how much temperature increase is a function, of course, of the geothermal gradient. And that geothermal gradient can range vastly between 10 degrees per kilometer all the way actually to 35 or even more degrees per kilometers. So as you bury rock, there comes a point where the pressure becomes so big that it leads to the dissolution of those rocks. This is known as pressure solution. Here's an example of the different pressure solution you can have, mostly actually in limestone, but the, the same process applies to clastic just at greater depth. And you can see that we can have small stylolite or a small plane of dissolution. We can have proper stylolite and we can have also more diffuse wispy seams and solution seams. But let's focus on the stylolite here. And here's an example of a stylolite in limestone, actually from the Canterbury Basin that was recovered by IODP. And you can clearly see that we have a white limestone and this plane of dissolution here that represents the stylolite. And in the stylolite, the reason the stylolite plane is black is because we concentrate the impurities. That means that the limestone was dissolved. If you look at the matrix of the limestone, what's interesting is that this matrix is very fine grain in this case. You can recognize here planktonic forms and some clay material, very fine grain material. But if we apply cathodoluminescence to it, which will basically highlight burial cement, we see a lot of luminosity. And that luminosity really represents a limestone cement, a calcite cement.